So let us uh, continue with our discussion on power, right. So that is what we were discussing last class. So we said there are three components to the power, one is dynamic power, two is short circuit power. right and 3 is leakage power <coughs> okay. So uh, the idea here at least for the first two is the following if I have an inverter like this right and the input rises with some finite rise time and then falls with some finite uh, fall time. Then the output would basically go like this leaving all the you know second order bumps that I spoke about earlier. It would look like this <coughs> and in the process you would have a capacitor that is being charged and discharged right each time the output rises and falls okay. So we, we said that when the for dynamic power for dynamic power we said that when the capacitor has to charge there is an R equivalent of P which is going to charge like this right and of course the NMOS is cut off. Again the assumption here is the <coughs> uh, though I showed in reality that the input has a finite rise time and fall time here we are assuming that the input rises instantaneously or falls instantaneously which means that the PMOS is a perfect resistor and the NMOS just cuts off right and therefore the charging is going to happen where all the current from the supply will be used to charge the capacitor to VDD right and similarly when we are talking of the f uh, discharging case the PMOS will be cut off and the capacitor will get discharged through the NMOS transistor like this <coughs> okay. right. So each time the uh, capacitor charge to VDD and energy of half CL VDD squared gets stored in this capacitor. Of course the power supply has supplied CL into VDD squared that is the amount of energy that this power supply gave where did the remaining energy go it got dissipated in the resistance as heat in the through the PMOS transistor okay. So irrespective of what the resistance is or what the width of the uh, PMOS transistor is the same amount of energy is dissipated in that PMOS transistor always right and of course when the uh, capacitor gets discharged right when the output sort of falls then the same half CL VDD squared gets dissipated through the NMOS transistor and all the current flows into the ground. So overall for every charge discharge cycle right energy equals what CL into VDD square. Right, of course, this is going to be in joules because this is energy, right. Now, what we are talking about is dynamic power, okay. When we say dynamic power, it is only the power that is dissipated because of charging and discharging that load capacitor, including its own capacitance actually, right. That total capacitor that is the power that we are referring to in dynamic power, okay. So, now the point is if I have an arbitrary circuit like this right 
and let us say that this input is 0, okay, and then this input is switching constantly. What will happen to this input? Yeah, it will be 1, right? NAND gate output will be 1 if the input is 0. So, if the other input is not switching, the output can just remain there forever. So, what is the dynamic power that is dissipated by this NAND gate? It is basically 0 in steady state, right? So, it is not sufficient if we just say that, okay, every cycle that gate is going to charge or discharge that capacitor. That is not true. It depends on the inputs, it depends on the input combinations, input transition combinations and everything, right? There are so many things that it depends on. And therefore, we define something known as an activity factor. How often does this node switch for a given circuit, okay? So, for example, if I have a circuit with n inputs, okay, i1, i2, i m and outputs o1, o2 and o n, right. Uh, now, <coughs> the inputs could actually be switching every time, does not matter, right. This could be ideal clocks, it does not matter to me right or it could be some other arbitrary signals, okay. Now, the question is I need to find out how often every node inside this circuit is going to switch. So, how do you do that? You just have to run a probabilistic simulation, feed random input combinations and allow random transitions to happen and just count the number of times that this node has actually switched. Okay, that gives you the probability of that node switching. So, question is why can't I do it for all possible combinations of the inputs? If I have m inputs, how many input combinations do I have? 2 power m. Now, how many transition combinations do I have? That is much worse, right. So, therefore, you cannot exhaust all these things, but it is sufficient if you just take, for example, maybe a million transitions, you just allow a million input patterns to be applied to this uh, circuit and you just count what is the probability of each of those nodes switching. Now, that becomes the activity factor of that particular node, right. And therefore, the energy, right, average per node will become alpha C L V T D squared depending on how often that is going to switch, right. Now, if you have something like a clock, the activity factor for a clock is 1, it is switching every single cycle, right. So, that is the highest possible active activity factor that you can have. For every other node, it will be somewhere between 0 and 1, right. Mostly, it will be actually quite low, right. So, <coughs> now how do we convert this to power? So, what will happen is typically these inputs here, if you look at the circuit, will get buffered through flip flops, okay. They have flip flops here, flops. So, what will happen is the input actually can change only every every rising edge of the clock. Even you even if you apply it at a faster rate changing somewhere, right, it, it will not reflect in the change inside the circuit. So, you can assume that all the inputs are synchronous and there is a central clock which is controlling the entire circuit, right. And if that clock is running at a frequency of f clock, right, let us assume that this clock is running at f clock, then what is the dynamic power? It is the rate of change of energy, right. You have alpha C L V D D squared which is the average energy depending on switching factor and all that and this is going to happen at a rate of f clock, right. Therefore, alpha C L 
V D D square into F clock is the dynamic power for a logic gate in general. Okay, so if I ask you what is the dynamic power of this inverter, well it does not, it not the question is not complete, you have to tell me where I place this inverter in which circuit and how, right, then you have to tell me what its load capacitance is, right, you give me all this information then I can say that yes, for that particular node which has a capacitance CL, it is going to have a dynamic power of alpha CL VDD squared into F, right, clearly. VDD dependence being quadratic is the strongest way in which you can control dynamic power. If you drop VDD by half, your dynamic power will drop by one fourth, right. So, this is the strongest control of dynamic power, okay. So, what you have to do is if, if I am given a particular circuit like this here and I want to calculate the total dynamic power, I need to estimate first what is the switching factor of this node, what is the switching factor of this node, what is the switching factor of this node. Then I have to estimate what the total capacitance is on each of these nodes, right. Then for each of them, we are, it is going to happen at alpha CL VDD squared into F, okay. Any questions here? So, during steady state there is no, the dynamic power is not even defined because the capacitor is just holding charge and it is being driven to either VDD or ground, no problem, okay. Any questions on dynamic power, okay. So, let us now move to short circuit power. So, uh, we made an assumption in dynamic power that the input is going to change instantaneously, right. That means, the, the PMOS becomes a resistance, the NMOS becomes a cutoff switch or vice versa, NMOS is a resistance, PMOS is a switch that is cut off completely. In that model, there is no current between supply and ground at any point in time be it in steady state or in during the transition, right. Of course, in reality that is not true and therefore, we need to consider that also into our calculation here. V in, V out. So, my input as I told you is going to go like this. V in. So, let us now plot the current I V D D, okay. There is going to be a current that is going to flow from V D D to ground like this. Obviously, in steady state, it is going to be 0, right. At what point will the I V D D become non-zero first, yeah. When V input crosses V T N, obviously it is going to turn on the NMOS transistor, PMOS is obviously turned on already, therefore you will start having I V D D after V in crosses V T N. Now, at what point will it turn off? Will it come back to 0 again? Yeah, or VDD minus mod VDP, or you say VDD plus VDP. So, here, so this, by the way, this on for this graph, this is time, okay. So, therefore, here, this is my, these are the two points, VTN. VDD plus VTP, right. So, now in between your current is going to go up and then come down, right. 
as the input crosses VTN and starts turning on the NMOS transistor, NMOS starts in saturation, PMOS in linear, slowly the PMOS will also come to saturation mode at which point the current will be maximum. What is that point called? Trip point, Vm, V in equal to V out equal to Vm, right. After that again the, the PMOS starts going into saturation, NMOS will come into linear, therefore reducing the current and then back into cutoff. So in this region, you can approximate the current as a triangular region like this, right. And this we are going to call it as that, uh, let me call it I naught, right, or no, let me call it I peak, I peak, okay. This is that current that we evaluated at V in equal to V out equal to Vm. Now similarly in the falling edge, you are going to have exactly the same kind of uh, thing. Somewhere out here it will happen, out here it will happen and the current will, maybe I should remove all this, too many, too many lines. So this is again my VDD plus VTP. So this again will go up like this, come down to 0 and then you will be done. Okay. So now we just need to calculate the short circuit energy, right. So what is the short circuit energy? ESC, integral VI DT, right. So, so let us assume that this is going to happen for a particular time right. So, it will simply be 0 to T. What is V? Where is the current coming from? VDD. So, what is the V in this equation? Integral V I DT. The current is coming from this supply. I am looking at the power delivered by the supply. So what is the V in that equation? VDD, it is a constant into I short circuit of T, right or I called it I VDD into DT, right. So basically it is just multiplying by VDD and finding the area under this triangle, right. So that is nothing but half VDD into I peak, right, into half base into height, right, into T. Now you can, if I give you the slope at which the input is rising, then you can calculate what this T is, how long it takes to go from v, VTN to VDD plus VTP, right, given the slope is say VDD by T rise. Let us assume that this slope or it is also called slew is VDD by T rise and this slope is VDD by T fall. So let us assume T rise equal to T fall. So can you tell me what the answer is for the short circuit power, I mean energy. Yeah.
let us make an assumption that V T P is minus V T N, right. So, you can write this as minus 2 V T N by what? P G D into T rights, right. Assume that V T N equals minus 2 V T P. If Of course, this expression here is only for the rise, for a rise and fall, it is going to be twice that, right. So, I can just say VDD into IP into T, IP into T and then you substitute this expression, you will get the expression for the short circuit energy, clear, right. So, remember that this is going to happen for a very, very, very short period okay. Of course, it does not happen in steady state, but in the transition period even this thing is going to happen for a very short period, okay. So, maybe if your slew is very, very bad, then the amount of time at which the current can flow is going to be large, right. But usually in high speed circuits, you will ensure that the slew is also very good and therefore, it is a extremely short period, clear. So, therefore, you can write E S C as can someone tell me the expression V D D into I P into V D D twice V D D minus 2 V T N. into T rise, correct. Hmm. Ah. No, I thought we removed the half because this is for rise and fall. See this was basically the half B H of here, right, in this region. What about this region? So, when it rises and falls, the charge discharge cycle is what I am asking for. See, T is because what I am saying is, it is going from 0 to I P in a time of T, right. So, oh yeah, you are right, you are right. Sorry, 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 you are right. This is not T by 2. Correct, correct, correct. So, it is the input is taking a time T to go up. Yeah, you are right. Sorry. That is a mistake. So, this will vanish. Okay. Is that fine? Uh, oh, VDD will get cancelled, V i into T, correct, yeah, power, power into time is energy, yeah, okay. Now, again, just like dynamic power, this is a transient phenomenon. Only when the input is making a change will this happen and therefore, the same things that we discussed there will apply here also. You need the activity factor only when that switches is going to happen and so on. Therefore, the short circuit power is going to be alpha E S C into F clock, okay. So, alpha into I P into T rise into F clock. Why? No, no, no. Yeah, but as she pointed out, see, the, I am giving you that the input rise slope is VDD by T rise. Correct. So, it takes, the input takes from 0 to T 
to go from VTN to VDD plus VTP. So you have to look at this guy. This is T. If you look at this triangle, this is T. Okay, and that is the slew. That's what I'm defining as the slew. Clear? Yeah. So therefore, that's yeah. 